proceed. Hi, I'm Tim Naftali. I'm director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library Museum in Yorba Linda, California. It's May 28, 2009. Uh, we are outside of Wilmington, Delaware, and I am uh, fortunate and privileged to be interviewing Angela Lano for the Richard Nixon Oral History Program. Mr. Lano, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Uh, just to give people some background, tell us what you did for the Bureau before you found yourself involved in uh, investigating Watergate. Uh, I became a special agent with the FBI in August of 66. Uh, I was initially assigned to Indianapolis for approximately 22 months when I was transferred to Washington in uh, June of 1968. Um, and uh, what kind of kinds of cases would you work on between 68 and 72? Uh, between 68 and 72, I mainly worked on theft of government property issues, uh, interstate transportation of stolen property, uh, bombings of uh, several embassies during that time period. And I worked with the Metropolitan Police Department Burglary Unit uh, because the district is so small but bordered by uh, both Maryland and Virginia, anything that was stolen valued over $5,000 was presumed to have traveled in interstate commerce, either into Maryland or Virginia or, or beyond. Um, it's June 17th, <clears throat> 1972. Uh, when, uh, when do you hear about the break-in and when are you assigned the case? <laughs> At 8 o'clock that morning, um, the phone had rung, and I knew, actually I'd, I had wakened uh, a couple hours earlier. I heard raindrops, and I knew that uh, that morning, uh, my sons had baseball practice, uh, and I was worried that we were going to be uh, postponed. But fell back to sleep. Phone rang at around eight, eight ten, and it was a supervisor from uh, Washington Field, or Ernie Belder. Uh, and Ernie told me that the SAC Bob Kunkel uh, wanted me to go to the Watergate complex because there had been a burglary. And this was a Saturday morning, and I said. Uh, it's Saturday. I have baseball practice in, in about an hour with the kids. And you have a criminal agent on duty. Uh, why can't he go? And the response came back, because Kunkel wants you to go. You handle, uh, I, I had handled a couple of break-ins at the Watergate complex, one of them being uh, the apartment of Rosemary Woods, uh, the president's uh, secretary. Uh, so anyway, I basically said, uh, I'm going to go to baseball practice and hung up the phone. Uh, probably within two or three minutes, Mr. Kunkel called. And he explained to me what had happened, that these, quote, five international jewel thieves had been apprehended in the uh, Watergate complex. And I told him the same thing. You have a criminal agent on duty. Uh, I'm going to baseball practice. And he said, no, you're going. So I did. Uh, I called a friend of mine, Pete Paul, another agent who lived close by, and I asked him if he'd ride with me uh, down to police headquarters. I think it was the second district. And uh, I said, we'd only be a couple hours. We'd check into these people that were arrested, find out what it's about, and then we'll come home and we'll, we'll get the kids together for baseball. Little did I know, we arrived around 9.30, met with the police, and I believe we got home at midnight. Um, there were five individuals uh, under arrest. Uh, I went to their uh, respective cells, asked their names, identification, and uh, tried to question them, but they each uh, declined, saying that they had already asked for a lawyer. I asked the uh, deputy chief of police, I uh, can't remember his name, um, but members of the burglary squad were there, and along with Assistant uh, U.S. Attorney Chuck Worth. Um, Chuck represented the uh, Justice Department in the Superior Court for uh, Washington. And um, Chuck explained to me what had happened, that these individuals had been apprehended in the Democratic uh, Committee headquarters, and that they had certain devices uh, with them. One they thought was uh, a bomb, or, or a premix precursor for a bomb, um, I asked if we could review the evidence, and uh, we noticed that they had cameras, and I can't remember the number, I want to say 30 to 40 rolls of, of film. 
and they had this uh, AWOL bag. So I asked if I could examine the AWOL bag to see what else was in there, and there were more rolls of film. But down in the bottom, there was uh, something in tissue paper, and I pulled the tissue paper, and out fell this little black device with an antenna on it. And I reached in, pulled another piece of tissue paper, another black device, another black device. And I looked at uh, Chuck Worth and I said, you know, I don't think this is uh, something that these people should possess. I think this is a listening device. And if you don't mind, the supervisor, Ernie Belder, happened to be a uh, technician's expert for the electronics expert for the Bureau. And I said, can we take one of these or two of them and run them back to headquarters and see, you know, if, if we're right. Uh, Pete took them, went back and met with uh, Ernie, and within 20 minutes, Ernie said, this is wiretapping equipment. We don't make it here in the district, you know. Presented that to the uh, assistant U.S. attorney, Chuck Wirt, and um, included that in the uh, search warrant, which they were typing, uh, because I think at the time of the arrest, one of the burglars had a key to... Uh, Watergate Hotel uh, room, and um, later we got the search warrants, uh, probably took them maybe an hour to draft the search warrants. Uh, however, the devices uh, turned out to be, as I said, uh, devices that you would probably plant inside a telephone or in a wall probably, and um, so we took the information, added it to the search warrant went to the Watergate Hotel and executed search warrants on two rooms. Um, another agent joined us, but there were like maybe a half a dozen detectives at, at the scene also. So myself and maybe three detectives went to one apartment. The rest of the detectives went to another one. I, I, I don't remember the room number that, we went, that I was involved in the search with, but when we opened the door, um, there was a sliding glass door leading onto the balcony. The windows were, the, the, the doors were drawn back and the curtains were just flying in the wind. And we were, I think we were on like the second floor. And I said, basically, well, if somebody was here, they're going in the wind now because the curtains are flowing. Uh, but immediately when you walk into the room, there was a bed and uh, we, we looked and everything was kind of neatly arranged. Um, Clue number one, something wasn't right here. But there were $100 bills. Uh, there were wallets with the various identifications. There were a, one or two address books. So I basically knelt down on the floor with a piece of, because I only had one piece of paper in my pocket. And it was folded up in six different ways. So I scratched the serial numbers of the bills, and they did look like they had just come from a mint. And I wrote those down. In the meantime, um, one of the other agents was examining items that were in and out in a dresser. In addition to clothing, um, he discovered an envelope uh, with a return address of E. Howard Hunt, and it was addressed to some country club. Um, that was opened, and we found out that it was a check from Hunt paying for dues or something to a country club. So we made a note of that. Um, we left When we left there, we gathered whatever, whatever information we had. The police department maintained control of the evidence. I took my little scrap of paper and notes and Hunt's name and everything and we went back to the office. Um, I called, first thing I did was call a friend of mine uh, who worked for Secret Service and I had worked some bombing cases with him and I asked him if he could do me a favor either that day or first thing Monday, can you run some bills for me and tell me either when they were printed or what Federal Reserve Bank they may have gone to? That was number one. Number two was to check the names of all the individuals. And they were like Edward Martin. Uh, I don't remember the rest of them. But anyway, Edward Hamilton and Edward Martin, I think, were two. Um, so from there, we, we checked what we called indices to see if we had any files on these individuals. And the first one that jumped out was E. Howard Hunt, special consultant to the White House. We had 
the FBI had conducted a background investigation for him to have a clearance to have access to the White House or national security information, whichever. Um, once we reviewed that file and saw who he was assigned to at the White House, uh, Pete Paul and, and the other agent, the criminal agent that was working that day, drove out to uh, Hunt's house. Um, I think the first approach, he wasn't there. Uh, they stayed around for a while. He eventually did uh, respond to the, to the front door and uh, declined to be interviewed. Uh, that was our first and only contact with Hunt for, for probably several months uh, because shortly after that he took off for, as it turns out, Los Angeles. Uh, from there, we were making some phone calls uh, to the White House to find out about Hunt's role over there. Uh, we spoke to Mr. Butterfield, who told us that Hunt actually worked for Mr. Colson. Um, I'm trying to remember uh, as best I can what, uh, other than searching files, oh, called Miami and uh, got a hold of a case, a duty agent down there, told him what we had going up here in Washington, that we had these four individuals who came from that area and we'd like you to check your indices. You know, so let's start a background, find out who these people are. Why are they up here and exactly what's going on? So... you only had their aliases at the crew. Uh, well, actually what happened was, yes, we had their aliases, but only for about an hour because not only did did Pete take the electronic devices to Ernie to, to see what they were uh, to confirm our suspicions, but he also took the fingerprint cards and went to IDET. So he had two jobs that day. Um, within an hour, uh, we knew these, indiv we had their names. We, we knew exactly who they were. We knew that uh, McCord, he, I think he was Martin, I think when he was arrested, and we actually found out that, that he was James McCord. Although we didn't know his employment, uh, we had a copy of his rap sheet which showed that he was former uh, FBI and CIA. The four Cubans also came back with uh, rap sheets, which identification records, which uh, indicated that they also had an affiliation at one time or another with the CIA. And, um, and we had their true names. So with the aliases and the true names, calling Miami, giving them the background on, on what had happened in, in Washington and asking them to do what they could for us uh, as quick as possible. That really did take a lot of time and it, phone calls back and forth, as I said, with, with Butterfield and uh, White House operator trying to, to locate Hunt. Um, took us up to probably 11, 12 o'clock that night when, you know, when we went home. Uh, we didn't get to baseball practice. The wives ended up taking the, the boys to, uh, to practice. Um, Sunday. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. About that day? Um, Barker's um, address book. Okay. Uh, did, did that play a role at all in, in, in connecting uh, Hunt to the story? And can I stop you one second? In this, in your video, is. Um, uh, does your audio need to be like his, like prominent? Or is, does he need to incorporate your question in the audio? No, they have to be able to hear the question right. in, the audio, in the video. Okay, let me stop that. Do you want to share that? Is that question and we can start? Okay. And this is just a pickup or a, a new mic setup with Boom on Tim, and which is Channel 2, and Channel 1 Live is on Angelo. Angelo, um, what role did finding Barker's um, address book play in figuring out Hunt's role? The address book, there were, there were two. One was a flip top type of uh, telephone index, index. The second was a personal telephone book. Uh, we took no possession of those. In fact, I don't recall even looking at them the first day. Um, it wasn't until probably Tuesday of the following week when there had been numerous um, newspaper articles about uh, immediately after the break-in that 
the name Hunt had surfaced and that Hunt had a private tele or had a telephone number at the White House. Um, it wasn't that we didn't know about it because we had already confirmed that he was a quote consultant to the White House, so we knew he had some connection to the White House. The telephone book and all the evidence uh, did not was not turned over to the United States Attorney's Office and eventually to us for perhaps three or four days after the investigation began. Uh, and it was, I had requested uh, Earl Silbert to uh, have the police department turn that material over because there appeared to be um, information was being leaked somehow or other uh, from that address book to, to the public uh, about Hunt and, and other names that were in there. Oh, so that, those leaks came from the police department? No. Um, in, in a way, they did. Uh, let me back up one second here. When the search warrant was being executed, uh, I happened, like I said, I was kneeling on the floor writing down the serial numbers of the bills, and I happened to look up at the doorway leading into the apartment, and there were two individuals standing in the doorway. One of them was a detective. Um, the other, as it turns out, was the Washington Post reporter, Al Lewis, who, uh, Art Smith, one of the other detectives, was next to me also recording serial numbers. And I asked Art, you know, who this, who this guy was, and he told me it was, it was Al Lewis from, from uh, the Washington Post. And I said, well, why is, why is the Post here? And, and he basically said that, well, they go with them on major cases. You know, they always show up. So that's how the Post initially was involved in, in getting information. Now, he did not have access to the serial numbers at that time. Um, as you know, when, it, when they uh, execute a search warrant, there has to be a return made to the court on what items were seized. Um, one of the returns was approximately four, about three or four pages of typewritten material, um, and it was about the size of uh, legal pad paper. So I presume that it took the police officer, probably the detective who prepared that, probably two days to you know uh, uh, describe all the evidence seized to the court, and. Perhaps at that time, Mr. Lewis obtained a copy of the return. It would have been available to, uh, you know, via the court anyway. But he was there on the scene, and that's how they initially got uh, their information. But the address book was at the scene. You just, yes. The FBI didn't take uh, possession of it. No, we, we, didn't, we didn't take anything and for, like I said, three or four days later. So it was through the Hunt's alias that you were able to figure out. You, you, the, no, no, his name was, it was E. Howard Hunt on the envelope. But he that was what, but that's what did it? Yes. That was the envelope, the, the check for the country club? Country club, yes, yes. That was the, the, our immediate uh, contact. Um, was there a protocol in place uh, at that point if you found out that someone was CIA? That you, I mean, if you found yourself investigating CIA officers or uh, that... Uh, that you had to let the agency know? Um, actually, telephone, I indicated telephone calls were sent to, were made to Miami. I also made a phone call over to the Alexandria field office, uh, which covered uh, Langley, and basically asked them that, uh, if possible, that day, uh, could they ascertain uh, whether or not these people were the, the, the names that we had. Uh, the Cubans, were they actually employees or perhaps consultants uh, for the agency? And that, like I said, we indicated uh, to Alexandria immediately on, on that Saturday afternoon. All right, you finally get a night's sleep, and it's Sunday. Have you recall? I, I didn't go in on Sunday. Another agent covered for me on Sunday. Um, when does this be... Uh, how many people are working with you? How does this become a task force? I mean, uh, well, initially there were probably four or five of us on Monday, and by Friday, I believe the number was up to twenty-four. Um, it, it's 
it's hard to describe it. I mean, it was just phenomenal as to what happened. Uh, looking into Hunt's background, uh, finding out the names of all his associates, um, immediately issuing a subpoena for him to uh, appear to appear before a grand jury later that week, um, identifying Colson as his quote contact at the uh, at the White House or a possible employer uh, at the White House. Um, I believe it was either through no, I believe it was through Butterfield. Uh, Alex, Alex Butterfield that we ascertained that Hunt also had a, an employment with the Mullen Company. So we were engaged in trying to uh, ascertain uh, where in the Mullen Company he was employed, what his role was there, and who his contacts were. That Monday morning or Monday afternoon, um, we had received a phone call from, I believe, the manager of the, of the Howard Johnson and who indicated that he had seen McCord's photograph in the newspaper and said that he was pretty certain that this individual had rented uh, a room at the uh, Howard Johnson's. So I think we sent four guys over to the Howard Johnson's. And in the meantime, had to send a couple of guys back to the Watergate Hotel uh, to gather all the uh, hotel records together. Um, it was when we were gathering those records that we found out that not only were the Cubans uh, in the um, Watergate Hotel in June, but they had been there also in, in May. Um, so gathering those records was assigned to a couple of agents. When we got to the Howard Johnson's and started looking at those records, I think it took maybe a day before um, the Howard Johnsons finally got all their records together. Then we started examining their, their phone calls that were made, and there were numerous calls being made to someplace, I believe it was New Haven, Connecticut area. Um, so I had a, a few agents set aside just to, to handle all the telephone calls, all the records there. Um, as I said, looking for Hunt was was a number one priority. Uh, we there was a a, a rule at uh, at the FBI that no one could go, an agent could not go to the White House and conduct an interview without FBI headquarters permission. You couldn't go to to Langley and and request an interview without FBI uh, authority. So, in addition to um, having the agents on the street do some of the legwork. Uh, I was also sending communications over to headquarters requesting permission to interview certain people uh, or to conduct record checks at uh, CIA headquarters. Uh, one of the interviews we wanted to do immediately was, of course, uh, uh, Chuck Colson. Um, at the time, Pat Gray had been named the, uh, excuse me, the acting director, and uh, he wasn't uh, uh, at his desk. I'm not sure if he was in. California or New York somewhere. Uh, so it fell to the number two man for the approvals, but we, we just weren't getting the approval to get to, uh, uh, to Colson. Um, we finally did get the, uh, the interview, and I think it was on the 22nd. Um, he was uh, very cooperative, uh, answered every question that we had about uh, Howard Hunt. Uh, Prior to the interview, though, we were instructed, or I was instructed, uh, to tell the agents that any interviews being conducted at the White House would be conducted in the presence of uh, John Dean, who was um, counsel to the president. Um, I challenged that because we had an FBI handbook, and the rule was uh, we don't conduct interviews in the presence of attorneys uh, unless there was some type of uh, agreement between the the prosecutor and and the uh, and the FBI. Um, I was told that if we wanted to do the interviews, they had to be done in his presence. So uh, we did the interview. Uh, it was toward the end of the interview. Um, I had asked Mr. Colson if Hunt had an office there, and he said basically that he had an office. He said probably no bigger than a closet. Uh, at which time uh, John Dean said. Uh, he didn't know that Hunt had an office 
in the in the uh, this is the executive office building. Uh, he didn't know Hunt had an office there, uh, and if so, why would you be interested? And I had in my pocket a, the subpoena, and I said because of this paper, uh, the subpoena for him to appear at the grand jury. Uh, I said maybe on the top of his desk, in plain view, there could be a note. Uh, an address, a friend, something to give us a lead as to where he might be. Uh, Dean indicated he would check into it and get back to us. That was on June 22nd. Um, I believe it was June 26th or the 28th, uh, Dean was in contact with me and told me that uh, he had uh, contents uh, that he wanted to turn over to us that came from Hunt's office. Uh, so I sent um, an agent over who walked from 12th and Pennsylvania to the White House, uh, was given this big cardboard box by John Dean, and uh, uh, his name was Dan Mahan. And uh, Dan put the box on his shoulder and carried it from the White House back to, uh, uh, to, to the field office. And, um, w you know, we immediately said, you know, well, what, what, what's this? What's in it? And, uh, you know, there were these, as it turns out, there were cables uh, from the State Department. It appeared that someone was trying to manufacture um, a document indicating that the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the State Department tapes were about South Vietnam and uh, President Diem, I believe his name was. And it appeared that they were trying to someone was trying to prepare a document uh, indicating that the former President Kennedy was behind the assassination of this, of this uh, individual. Um, there was also a small uh, automatic we uh, handgun, I think it was a, excuse me, 22 or 25 caliber, I'm not sure. Um, there was some, somebody indicated there was electronic equipment there was no, there were no bugging devices in that box. Uh, it was uh, basically an antenna for uh, a handheld radio, um, and a couple of other items I don't recall specifically. But we no sooner looked at them than we'd said, "Wait a minute, um, where did this come from?" And he said, "Hunt safe," and uh, that's what Dean had told uh, Dan. We said, well, let's go back and find out exactly where this safe was and how did he get access to it. So again, we had to send a, two or three agents over to, do, uh, to interview uh, Secret Service personnel, GSA personnel who were responsible for certain items in the uh, executive office building, et cetera. And uh, lo and behold, we find out um, that these items were taken out of Hunt's alleged office on the 19th of June. And we said, uh, that, that can't be right because on the 22nd, Dean said he didn't know Hunt had an office, but GSA had records that said, no, we drilled a safe for John Dean and, and uh, I think the items were turned over to Fred Fielding, his assistant, uh, on that same day. So we had a problem, uh, which I discussed with, uh, with Earl, and I said, things, something's wrong. Um, why, why would he tell us that he didn't know Hunt had an office and he had this, these items in his possession uh, even before we did the interview of, uh, of Chuck Colson? So that was set aside for the time being. Um, in the meantime, the Information uh, was given to the agent over in Alexandria from the CIA that they had no information about uh, Edward Martin or Edward Hamilton um, and that the, they couldn't tell us anything um, affirmative about the Cubans being employees or consultants. They had no actual records of them being on a payroll at the time. That kind of died right there. We never heard anything more from them. Um, even though we kept sending requests over for 
for additional information. We just weren't getting any responses. In the meantime, there was an article, and I think it was in Time Magazine, um, which caused a big con uh, consternation at, excuse me, at, at FBI headquarters that um, there, a reporter had written an article indicating that Gray had put a 48-hour 48, 48 time limit uh, on the investigation and uh, something else uh, escapes me. But um, that Friday, this is almost a week later, uh, Bob Kunkel had come up to the office and he had, he had said that uh, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, everyone is to come back to the office. And like, as I indicated, by then we had 24, maybe up to 27 personnel, in, including one supervisor. Um, indicated we had to be there and we were going over to see the, the uh, acting director around 11.30. No indication what was going on. Prior to that meeting, uh, I would confer with Kunkel every day, maybe four or five o'clock, basically give him a summary of what we had developed during the day. At the same time, uh, Earl Silbert and Glanzer and, and Don Campbell every day they would come to the office uh, for the first couple of weeks and, and review the teletypes, uh, the, the 302s that were being developed, so that they had knowledge of, of uh, current events because it was almost impossible to, to keep briefing different people uh, of everything that was going on. So um, one day, I'm, I think it was like the, eight, the 19th or the 20th, uh, in my contacts with Kunkel, who would then inform someone at FBI headquarters as to what we had learned. Um, he asked me, you know, where we were and what I thought was going on. And I said, well, we got one or two answers back from Langley. I said, but we're not getting everything that we asked for. And I said, in, in my personal opinion, I said, right now it sounds like it's an operation that came from the other side of the river. Now, I didn't know who he was passing that information on to. Um, but with that in mind, that, that Saturday morning, we marched in unison over to the director's office. Uh, there were two, no, there was one assistant director there, Charlie Bates, Bob Kunkel, a couple of bureau supervisors, and, and Mr. Gray. And we were all lined up around the director's table, and then he just tore into us. Uh, he was astonished that uh, uh, he wanted to know who was leaking the information to the press and to Time Magazine, and uh, I never said I wanted this investigation conducted within 48 hours. I wasn't going to tell you to stop. I told you to go full bore on it. Um, and he basically uh, wanted someone to step forward and acknowledge being the leaker. And he ended up with a quotation of, of uh, calling us uh, yellow-bellied singing canaries. And we, we were just astonished because being criminal agents, you have to understand that we work with the prosecutor, the United States Attorney's Office, and we work with a federal grand jury. So as criminal investigators, you know that one of the things you don't want to do is release information to the public that's going to damage uh, a grand jury investigation or uh, give a defendant an opportunity to challenge what you have or uh, influence a possible uh, jury. So we, we keep things close to our chest. And I knew, I knew that none of those people uh, had leaked any information. If there was a problem, it had to be coming from, from, uh, from someone higher up or people higher up. Um, so we, um, before we left, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, Gray indicated that he wanted a report uh, on our activities, investigation, um, immediately that, that following Monday. And uh, believe me, I was just a peon in the office uh, speaking to the acting director and I said, it's impossible. Uh, and he challenged me on why I said it was impossible. I said, because 
we have investigations going on all over the country, and um, we, we do not have the reports back. So you can't have a report on the following Monday. Uh, I'll give you a report, and I think I said July, July the 5th. Uh, and he said, okay, from July 5th on, I want one every seven days. So we, we worked around that. Um, on the way back to the office, one of the individuals who was uh, assigned to work basically as like uh, an administrative aide with me uh, was, uh, God rest his soul, Pinky McGivern. Pinky had been an agent for about almost 40 years. Uh, and he was going to be the report writer. In other words, he would assemble everything that we had developed and put his name and, and, and my name on the report and ship it across the street and to the prosecutor's office. And uh, I, I remember walking down Pennsylvania Avenue with Pinky and um, had my arm around his shoulder and he said, uh, I've, I've been um, with the Bureau for 35 or 40 years, one of those two dates. Uh, I've never been challenged. No one's ever challenged my integrity, and it's not going to happen again. And I basically said, you know, Pinky, it's, it, it wasn't you, and it wasn't any of these guys behind us, so, you know, just let it roll off your shoulders and let it go. Um, it was also during that week, uh, and I think it was Tuesday, that my friend from uh, Secret Service had called me back, and he was able to tell me that the uh, uh, Federal Reserve had shipped the money to Atlanta and from Atlanta it went to Miami. Okay, so I take John's information and just as I'm about to tell Miami, uh, Miami called and said, uh, hey, we're, we've, we found an account down here, can you get us a subpoena? Uh, and I immediately had a subpoena prepared, shipped to Miami, the I think it was a Republic National Bank for Barker's account. And he said, we found some interesting things here, but we can't really do anything about it until we get the subpoena. So we, we faxed the subpoena down there. They called back that night and they said, uh, this, <laughs> this guy's been active. He's just running some heavy checks through here. We came up with, I think that's when we found it was $112,000 or $114,000 in checks that had gone through uh, Barker's account. Uh, and at the same time, I said, well, wait a minute, um, the Miami Federal Reserve shipped brand new $100 bills to the Republic National Bank on such and such a date. And they said, well, that coincides with the dates that the checks were cashed. So from Washington to Atlanta to Miami to the Republic Bank, back to Washington, uh, we were pretty confident that those were the the hundred dollar bills that were found on the uh, the bed in the hotel room on the day of the 17th. So I, I think in order to get that information it took about I think it was two, two and a half days of, of uh, digging into records and thanks to uh, a couple of good guys at Secret Service they really helped us out on that. So that brings us to the 22nd? Well that was act that happened around the 22nd yes uh, and then that was also the the day that we did the Colson interview, uh, it, it was just phenomenal. I mean, it was like a, a tra freight train, you know, just rolling 100 miles an hour on a, on a straight path, and we just didn't know where we were going. I mean, we were just going everywhere. Um, Let me ask you about that for a minute, because on the tapes, you know, on the t please go and get some water, Wolf. I'm sorry. Um, on the tapes, on June 23rd, the president is going to be told, the FBI is interested in, in the money, mm -hmm. uh, and the name Dahlberg came, comes up. Right. Out. And Ogario is another name, <clears throat> a Mexican. Uh, when did you guys start to want to, when did you first of all hear the name Dahlberg and want somebody to interview him about the money? Well, was it, it was the, it was the day that the agents in Miami called, so it was either the 21st or the 22nd. And, but they had to have the subpoena first before we can get our hands on the checks or copies of the checks. And um, as soon as they got them, they called me back and then they faxed a, a copy of the checks up to us. Um, they, they had all the information there so they, 
they provided us with the name of, of Kenneth Dahlberg. Um, we tracked Kenneth Dahlberg. I'm not sure if his address was on the check, but anyway, we tracked uh, uh, Dahlberg to uh, Minneapolis. Um, Manuel Ogario, um, we tracked to Mexico City. So we immediately, one of the things we did, because it was such a fast-moving case, uh, we made phone calls first to the Minneapolis office, find this guy Dahlberg, let's find out what this money, this check was all about, and what's it doing in Barker's bank account. Uh, find Manuel Agario down there in, no, wait a minute, uh, it was to the agency first. Manuel Agario mean anything to you, along with these other names, Edward Martin, Hamilton and all that. Um, so we sent that request over there. In the meantime, we also sent it to our, our legat in, uh, in Mexico uh, to find Ogario and what's his check doing in Barker's bank account. So, you know, we immediately were, were, were gone everywhere. Um, it's, it's just mind-boggling as to, to what was going on. Now, you understand that we're, now we're in Minneapolis looking for Dahlberg. We're down in Miami doing the backgrounds on all these, uh, the Cubans and the bank accounts. Um, by then, we also, I think by the end of the week, that first week, we did have the address books. So it was taking the address books over to the photo lab at, at a headquarters, having them blow them up, and then making copies of them, and then finding, identifying the people uh, the, by, I guess by area code, because some were just telephone number with a, either an initial um, and an and a area code, and then shipping them out to, to other offices, uh, New York, uh, you name it, Philadelphia, et cetera. Um, and then, can you stop for a second? Yeah, sure. You can uh, stop um, for a minute. Yeah. Um, then stop back for a minute. Yep. You got me going. Yeah. Go ahead and you can say it. Um, what I, um, on, on the 23rd, the, the president is going to ac accept a proposal uh, that he used the CIA to put a hold on your investigation of the money. Um, and from FBI records from that period, open records, it's clear that, there, that, that your group requested permission to, um, inter to interview Mr. Dahlberg and Manuel Agario, and you didn't get approval for some time. What do you recall of that? The teletype went out. Uh, first the phone calls went out, and then it followed by a, a, uh, a teletype. And the teletype basically confirmed my instructions from earlier that day. Find Dahlberg, explain to us why, where the money came from, why did the check show up in, in Barker's bank account. And the same thing with uh, Ogario in Mexico City. Um, I believe it was the following morning that uh, I was told by uh, Bob Kunkel uh, that those leads were put on hold. And I asked him why, and he says, well, headquarters said we're holding off on them until we hear back from, from the agency on your other request. I said, okay, well, we have, you know, other things to do. At that time, it had, you know, nothing. Well, days were gone by, two, three, four days were gone by, and we weren't, still were on hold. So I sent another communication out basically saying, um, to headquarters this time, basically saying, why are we on hold? We need to get this information to the grand jury. We're, they're sitting there. They don't have anything to do. They're waiting for us to report back to them on our findings so that they can either issue a subpoena for Dahlberg or issue a subpoena to uh, Ogario to get them in here to testify about their actions. Um, finally, I think it was seven or eight days into it uh, that we finally, Kunkel called and said, uh, we're going to go ahead and interview uh, Dahlberg. Uh, Ogario is still on hold. So at some point, um, and I don't remember the exact date, uh, we went looking for Dahlberg. Um, we 
we didn't find him at home or he had just left home. Um, come to find out, he was in Washington meeting with Maury Stans. And by the time we learned that he was with Maury Stans, he had already left and I think he had gone to Buffalo for a wedding. So we ran to Buffalo to try and find him. We missed him there. Bottom line was I think we found him, eventually found him in, uh, in Florida. Uh, however, he had, he had given statements uh, on one or two occasions, none of which jived uh, to, what, to what he had to say in, uh, in uh, Florida. Uh, the problem being is that when he did uh, cooperate or give a statement, uh, he indicated that the money uh, had specifically come from an individual, uh, Dwayne Andreas, and they didn't want that information out because Mr. Andreas apparently was a big financial contributor to the Democratic uh, uh, Party, and they didn't want anyone to know that he was also contributing to the Republican Party. Uh, so we, we finally resolved Dahlberg with a subpoena um, and got him before the grand jury to figure out exactly uh, how the money came. And he had no idea that the check had gone to, uh, uh, to Barker. Um, in the meantime, there are four, five, six uh, agents trying uh, to ascertain at the committee to reelect uh, the president, as they called it, creep. Um, where the uh, payroll of um, who was responsible for McCord's payroll, uh, we needed his personnel file. Uh, we also wanted a copy of their um, um, addresses and telephone numbers of all their uh, employees uh, at, at Creep. Um, we never did get that. Uh, at the same time, um, we had interviewed Maury Stans about Dahlberg. And uh, Stans, I think, had put us off to uh, Sloan, Hank Sloan. Not, I'm sorry, um, I forgot his first name. But anyway, uh, Mr. Sloan. Uh, we tried to find Mr. Sloan. First, uh, Stan said that he was on vacation. You. You, Sloan. Thank you. Um, Hank was the assistant director of Quantico. Uh, so I got the two names confused. Um, anyway, uh, so Sloan was supposed to have been on vacation. Um, so we went looking for him as on his vacation spot. I believe it was in Utah and he wasn't there. He was back in Washington really. Um, then we finally did, we made three or four attempts to interview Sloan, uh, at which time he told the agency that he had an attorney and the attorney would be in contact with us. Well, we never really got to interview Sloan uh, because his attorney ran to the prosecutor's office and that was fine with us because that put it, put it straight in the hands of the grand jury so that was, uh, we'd get the information one way or the other. Uh, so that was left with the grand jury to handle. Um, there's so much going on. Um, Let me finally, listen, let's close the Elgario story. When did you finally get permission? Um, I'm not certain. I think it was probably toward the end of the month uh, because it was. It was toward the end of the month because uh, I had also had requests in to interview uh, John Mitchell. And we, that was in a, in a holding pattern also at the same time. Uh, then finally on the 20. I believe it was the 28th, um, I had sent a communication which Mr. Kunkel uh, would not sign off on. And I basically said, well, if you won't sign off on it, I'm signing your name to it. And uh, I put his initials on it and it went out. The next day, uh, Pat Gray called for a, a conference at headquarters and uh, was waving this uh, communication around basically saying who had the audacity to send a communication like this to the acting director of the FBI. And Mark Felt, Charlie Bates, Bob Kunkel, and a couple of other bureau supervisors and myself were all sitting at the table. And I'm just looking back and forth to see who's going to say anything. And I just raised my hand and I said, I said it. 
and he, he wanted to know why. And I said, because basically what it says, these people have been held in abeyance, the grand jury sitting down there on their hands, they're not getting the information that the FBI is supposed to be developing for them, and it actually looks bad for us. The next, that day, I think we, we had authority to go ahead and, and uh, locate uh, John Mitchell for the interview. Um, and it was either the same time as the interview for Mitchell was approved that finally the Ogario uh, interview had been approved. And I, I think that took place around the 30th of June or beginning of July. But in the meantime, uh, while that's going on, we're, we're fighting that battle, the Al Baldwin uh, issue arises. Uh, so so we, we have uh, Baldwin trying to uh, negotiate a deal with the uh, prosecutor's office. Did, excuse me, did you get him because of work in New Haven? Is that how you No, we got him through the telephone records. Telephone um, records that were at the Howard Johnson's indicated all these calls were being made up to the New Haven area. The New Haven agents uh, located him. He immediately asked for an attorney, so there were negotiations going on between his attorney and, and Earl Silbert, and, excuse me, and uh, uh, Seymour Glanzer. Uh, finally, we got, um, uh, they, they had some agreement, and um, Baldwin came to uh, Washington. Uh, we immediately did an interview. Um, prior to that interview, it was during the lookup in the address books that we kept coming up with these initials uh, GL uh, on, on several locations and some of the people that we had been interviewing in Florida who turned out to be friends of Howard Hunt talked about Hunt coming down there meeting with them but there was also this other gentleman with him who had gold cufflinks that said uh, GL on them or he had a tie tack that said GL and he identified himself as George Leonard. Well Finally, in the, in the uh, one day in looking through the book, we found, I, I found this number that we either overlooked or just couldn't figure out what it was. It was faint, and there was initials GL. Come to find out that uh, I sent, again, uh, Dan Mahan back to the uh, committee to reelect, and um, we found out that GL was none other than Gordon Liddy, and Liddy immediately uh, invoked uh, attorney-client privilege uh, Dan came back, we called headquarters and said we have identified this guy Gordon Liddy. Headquarters called back immediately and said he's a former agent. I'm thinking, oh my God, here we go again. Um, so we, we got the photograph of Liddy um, and when, we got, when Baldwin came down a couple of days later, Baldwin told the, the story about the, uh, uh, him being the monitor he actually wanted to be a bodyguard for, uh, for Martha Mitchell, but uh, McCord gave him this assignment. Um, he talked about riding around Washington with these two guys in a car. Uh, one of them, uh, when we show him the spread, photo spread, he identifies Liddy as, as the person he only knew as George. Um, so now we had Hunt, Liddy, and the, and the, and the Cubans. Um, we had uh, Magruder in the background, Strawn in the background, Chapin in the background, and Donald Segretti. You, you just, it, it's just impossible to describe what was going on and, and where everything was going. I mean, well, we were everywhere. Let's, let's t take it apart slowly. I, I, I don't the, know the, if you can. <laughs> Segretti. Where did that name come from? Where did Donald Segretti's name come from? Uh, Donald Segretti's name came from, I believe it was Hunt's address book. And Hunt's address book had been uh, collected the, uh, well, Hunt, where, where did you get Hunt's address book? Was, was I'm it sorry, the... oh, wait, was it Hunt's address book or Barker's? Well, no, had... it was, it was, I'm sorry, it was uh, telephone records from, uh, uh, from uh, Hunt's office at uh, the White House that led us to uh, Segretti in, in Florida. Uh, California. California, I'm sorry, California. Um, Gordon Strawn, how did his name come into this? Um, I, 
we, I think it was through Herb Combeck um, that we found out, um, can you break for a second? Yes. I, I have to think. Sure. Oh. Oh, I'm sure you will. We're rolling down. So, so the 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 whole, I'm just wanted to the hold on uh, the lifting of the hold on Agario might have been July sixth. It, it's it's possible. I, I knew that the first release, the first OK approval from that scathing teletype that I sent to headquarters was around the 28th, and I think it was the same day that they said it was OK to do Mitchell, and then it was, you know, there may have been a weekend involved. Uh, at that time, and then coming back in, uh, and the next thing we knew that we were permitted to go interview uh, Ogario. Now, personally, uh, we did not receive any information from uh, the agency that it was that Ogario had nothing to do with that. Um, that information, as we later find out, was being conveyed directly from the agency to Gray, and then Gray would parcel out whatever information he felt was, was necessary. All the information that I had requested early on about Martin, the identifications of Martin and Hamilton, all that ancillary in, uh, information, um, was actually given to Gray within days of the request. And after he resigned, uh, we found that information, or uh, not me, uh, FBI headquarters and cleaning out his office found memos from the agency um, responding to those requests detailing all the, in the, the information that they had provided to Hunt and Liddy of these false identifications of Martin and Hamilton. But they were you know, given to, to Gray and he kept them in his safe and never released them. So the bureau, I mean, the rest of the bureau, you guys working on the task force didn't learn that then until the spring of 1973. Yes, yes. Um, well, um, so you, you you you've got all these roadblocks and you don't even know about it. What? Uh, because the public will know who he is, but at the time, who was Mark Felt? What was he? What role, if any, did he play uh, Mark in your investigation? Mark Felt was the uh, second in command of of, uh, of the FBI. When Gray wasn't around, he was he was basically uh, running the show. Uh, what role he played for us? He was basically overseeing uh, the the investigation. Whatever teletypes or communications, telephone calls that were made to headquarters eventually made their their way to his office and and then to uh, into Gray's office. Um, it was interesting though, Gray apparently wasn't at his desk when I sent that teletype on the 26th or 28th and uh, normally bureau protocol is that when a communication written, uh, communication goes to headquarters, uh, there's a stamp on the right hand side which shows the basically chain of command as to where the document finally ends up, uh, felt it was interesting that in looking at the uh, headquarters file eventually, uh, felt never initialed that communication. Apparently, he must have considered it a, a hot potato also and just left it on, on Gray's desk for him to handle himself. Um, you, uh, did you, do you recall any interactions that you had with Mark Felt in, in this period? Uh, other than the fact that he was at that meeting, about four, four individuals, four. I mean, four contacts. Uh, the first one um, occurred maybe prior to the first grand jury uh, indictment uh, in in September. I'm not sure of the date, but uh, apparently uh, Woodward and Bernstein were. Uh, making phone calls to FBI headquarters, uh, asking questions, and uh, felt told Kunkel uh, that they wanted me to go interview, sit in with an interview with Bernstein, see if he could find out where they're getting their information from. Um, if you read the book, I'm this six foot two uh, FBI agent <laughs> who meets with Bernstein, uh, and he 
he says that I stop, we stopped behind the uh, Treasury Department. Uh, I said my shoe was untied and Bernstein knew that it was uh, a ploy, that there were other agents surveilling. It was all smoke. Uh, Kunkel did call me and tell me that uh, uh, Felt had wanted me to go interview Bernstein. So I did meet with uh, uh, Bernstein uh, and we did walk past the Treasury Department. We ended up in uh, Lafayette Square and it had, it must have been around the time of the uh, the first indictment because of his, Bernstein's concern or the Post's concern was the fact that we weren't doing anything about Segretti, we weren't doing anything about illegal campaign contributions and basically I was just explaining that um, this was a felony investigation. Yes, we knew about these misdemeanors, these illegal campaign contributions, dirty tricks. Those are misdemeanors and it was important for us to to get the uh, the felonies and follow that as far as, as we could. Uh, identify all the participants uh, as best we could and get those people uh, either cleared or indicted by uh, by the grand jury. Um, that was the extent of my, uh, my conversation with them. Um, the second encounter, Earl wanted to go, <laughs> Earl wanted to go to uh, Florida, Earl Silver wanted to go with uh, Don Campbell and uh, to Florida to interview. We, we must have developed maybe 30 potential witnesses down in the Florida area. And rather than the government pay to have all these people come up, it was cheaper uh, perhaps to send Silbert and Campbell to Florida to do the pre-trial interviews. Uh, and Earl said, you know, it's, it's necessary for you to go with us because you have control of all the evidence that we gathered. And um, I told, I think it was, yeah, Bob Kunkel was still there, and I told Kunkel that I was going to be going to Florida, and, and uh, he called Felt, and Felt said no. Um, so I was with Silbert one day, and I said, well, why don't you call my godfather? And Earl says, who are you talking about? I said, call Henry Peterson, and have Peterson call Mark Felt, and tell him that it's necessary that I, I go to Florida. So Peterson intervened with, with, to Felt, and I got to go to Florida. Um, well, we were down there about four or five days conducting all these interviews between Miami and Tampa. Um, the third contact was October of uh, 72. Um, Bernstein had called the office and it was 10 or 11 o'clock at night. They had developed information, the Post had developed information that there was a secret slush fund, uh, several hundred thousand dollars, and that this money was used as uh, uh, to pay, cover up, uh, silence uh, the, the five people that had been indicted, or seven people that had been indicted. Um, I told him I didn't know what he was talking about. He gave me a figure, and they play this game with you when they get you on the phone. If you hang up, we know we know it's true. Um, if you deny it, we're going to run it anyway. Something like that, uh, and it went on and on. Um, the questions were something to do with, "Did you ever interview Haldeman?" And I said, "John who?" And they said, "No, his name's Bob." I said, "Well, Bob or John? What's he have to do with the case?" And they said, "Well." He's the basically he's the number two man in the, you know, in the White House, uh, and I said, well, you know, we interviewed we interviewed John, and they said, no, we're talking about Bob, and I said, I, basically, I don't know what you're talking about, and I hung up, and I called Don Campbell, and I said, these uh, Woodward and Bernstein are pushing an issue about some uh, slush fund money. Uh, Don said that um, it was grand jury testimony. Um, and they had obtained some, inf the prosecutors had obtained some information from Sloan uh, about uh, several hundred thousand dollars. And uh, so I, I didn't pursue it. But the next morning, I uh, sent a uh, communication to headquarters saying that through the field office, these people had gotten in touch with us. Uh, and little did they know, my, my wife was listening in on the phone too to make sure I wasn't being trapped. Uh, but anyway, I sent a note over to headquarters and immediately 
uh, felt called uh, Kunkel and said I had to uh, submit a sworn affidavit that I didn't reveal anything. So I, I did. It was the first of several. Then the next time, uh, my other dealing with Felt was uh, the interview of uh, Martha Mitchell. Um, Martha, it was in early April of 73. Um, as you know, Martha had been on television, radio, interviewed by the newspapers constantly about, or she would be making statements constantly about her husband's non-involvement with the uh, uh, with the break-in. Um, we were having a conference in in Earl's office. We had we were doing they were doing some delicate work, and I was doing the follow-up work for him. And this there was some big announcement about uh, Martha being on TV again. And I said, why don't we just do the interview, nail her to the wall on on what she said? What information does she have? And Earl said, all right, arrange it. So um, I called uh, Mr. Mitchell and told him that you know, we, we had an interview with his wife. Um, could he give us an address or tell us when she would be available? Um, I, le I left the office that day. There was a note on my, my desk uh, saying that there was firearms the next day in Quantico. Um, and I totally forgot about Martha Mitchell was concentrating on firearms now. Was down at firearms, was on the range, and the range officer calls a halt to firearms and calls me in to the office and said, you have a phone call. Well, it turns out that it's Martha Mitchell calling me in Quantico. And I'm thinking like, uh, you, you can't be serious. And she says, no. She says, you know, you should have called me. You didn't have to call my husband. You want to interview me? I want to see you. Um, today. And I said, I'm a hundred miles away from Washington, or I don't know how far it was, but I'm an hour away from Washington. You're in New York. You know, we're talking four or five hour travel here. It's impossible. How about 11 o'clock tomorrow? And she said, fine and dandy, you be here. And she says, and I'm going to tape record the interview. And I said, Mrs. Mitchell, you can do whatever you want. I will be there. So I called McDermott, who was then the SAC in 73. Um, and I told uh, Jack that I was going to go to New York the next morning to interview Martha Mitchell. And I said, I'll pick up a New York agent to, uh, to assist me on the interview. Okay. Now, you do not let anyone use a tape recorder in an FBI interview. Um, and I didn't say anything to Jack about it. So the next day on the train to New York, I'm sitting there on the train with a legal pad figuring out, I got to figure, get this down to maybe 10 questions, get in and out, get the issue covered, get her remarks, get back to Washington. So I get off the train and I'm met with uh, met by another agent, Vinny Alvino. I prearranged pre to meet him. Um, She's on the fifth floor, I think, and I'm not sure of the address, but all I know is that the Kennedy family lived above her uh, because she, she told me about that. Um, so anyway, we're on the elevator going upstairs, and I told Vinny, okay, here's what we're going to do, and she's going to tape record the interview. Well, poor Vinny couldn't find a way to get out of that elevator. He didn't want any parts of it, and I said, Vinny, don't worry about it. I'll take the heat no matter what happens. So we go in. And uh, she's with, there's a secretary there. Sandy Hobbs, John Mitchell's secretary, is there. And uh, it's a long uh, hallway from one end to, excuse me, to the other. And we're sitting on the sofa. And here comes this beautiful lady walking down with her, you know, hair all done up and everything. I stand up and greet her. She grabs me. She hugs and kisses me. And I mean, she, she's just remarkable. It wasn't anything like I had experienced the day before uh, on the telephone. Uh, we talk a little bit, and finally she says, "Okay, are you ready?" And I said, "I'm ready." And she tells Sandy to put the recorder on the 
the table and we do the interview. Um, asked my 10, 12 questions, gave her a big hug and we left. And Vinny's shaking his head all the way to the train station saying, I don't know how you're going to get out of this. And I said, I'll get out of it. Um, go back to Washington and uh, got back just, just in time to catch McDermott. In fact, he sat and waited for me because he wanted to hear this. So um, I gave him the results of the interview. And um, I, at the end of it, um, he's a rotund, not, not, uh, he, he's well built. And he has this, he's red, I don't know if you've interviewed him, but he has a little burr in the back of his neck, uh, pure Irish. And um, at the end of my results, I said, uh, oh, by the way, uh, she tape recorded the interview. Well, this burr starts to, to light up on the back of his neck. And he turns around and he picks up the red phone. And I said, are you, he says, I got to tell Felt about the interview. I said, all right. <clears throat> so he picks up the phone and he goes through the results of the interview with Felt. And then there's this 15 second pause. And then he tells him, he says, uh, Lan the uh, Martha taped uh, Lano's interview. And the next thing, he's got the phone out here and Felt is just berating him and I as yelling as loud as he possibly could. If it's the last thing I do, you know, you two are gone. And uh, so when he got off the phone, I said, you know, it's my fault. I said, but I was damned if I did and damned if I didn't. I said, but the interview had to be done. So I went upstairs and, of course, Felt wanted a... a um, another affidavit as to why I did it and I violated every bureau rule in letting her do it. But I said again, even in my statement, I said I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't and I'm doing it and I did it. A year, no I think it was in, not a year, um, probably a month later a friend of mine at headquarters was going through the file looking for information uh, Gray's doing his uh, testimony on the Hill, and they find this memorandum. And it was a memorandum to Felt, dated April 3rd or 4th, whatever the interview with Martha was, and basically saying to Gray that um, McDermott knew that I had violated these bureau rules about tape recordings, and uh, he wanted us severely punished and basically said if it was the last thing he do, I will handle the punishment personally. And Gray had written on the bottom of the, uh, the memorandum, um, there's no need, they understand what they did, uh, they've been through enough, no punishment necessary. So I, I told you I'd escape it sooner or later. <laughs> you didn't expect it that way. Um, then the next time, my next contact with him, I, th I had two further contacts with him. One was about um, national security, the wiretap investigation, um, where he claimed that Gray had knowledge of the 17 illegal wiretaps. Um, and then the last interview I had with him was in a motel room, uh, and that was an allegation uh, made by, um, that came from an interview of, of Donald Segretti. Segretti was interviewed by a reporter named John Crutzen and during the course of the interview, Crutzen had a, according to Segretti, a briefcase full of documents all about the Segretti case and um, that investigation of uh, dirty tricks and whatnot. And um, Segretti uh, ascertained that some of these memorandum had come from um, Felt's office and Felt had already been retired by then. Um, myself and another agent interviewed uh, Felt um, at a motel in, if, excuse me, in Virginia, uh, and of course he denied any involvement in that. And that's, a, I think that was my last contact with him. Um, did you, uh, when you started seeing the Woodward and Bernstein articles, did you, uh, we discussed uh, where, you know, the D.C. police and Al Lewis may have been mm -hmm. involved, but did you begin to, to to suspect that the leaking was going on in the bureau, up higher up in the bureau? 
my, my first suspicions were that it was coming from uh, the, the day that we were basically chewed out by Gray. It was an article written by Sandy Smith. And um, someone, and I, I, I can't put a name on the person because I, I just don't recall who it was, but Sandy had, someone had told me that Sandy had come from Chicago. Uh, well, about the same time that um, Charlie Bates had transferred from Chicago to headquarters. And I thought it was interesting that these two people appear at the same time and suddenly, you know, there are, there are some leaks, but, um, but there were leaks, I think, one or two leaks before Charlie even got there. So I, I just knew that it wasn't any of us, the, the, the 27 guys and the supervisor that were uh, involved. I didn't, I didn't think it was coming from us, and, and uh, I, I never thought it was coming from uh, the prosecutors because you know, the 27 agents and the three prosecutors were all in the same boat. You know, we had one goal in mind, that was a grand jury, and you just don't reveal anything. So my suspicion had always been that it was coming from, from uh, headquarters, but uh, headquarters wasn't, I mean, someone in headquarters, but it wasn't only from someone in headquarters. There was no doubt that some of the information being leaked was coming from Creep, too, uh, or someone who had been in contact with the uh, officials at Creep. Um, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, Jeb Magruder. When did you, uh, did you interview Jeb Magruder or was that only done by the prosecutors? No, I interviewed Magruder, I think, I think on two occasions. And the prosecutors, I think they had him like maybe three times. Maybe I had him, maybe we had him three and three, but I, I had him uh, a couple of times. The initial interview was basically, um, you have to understand that we didn't know about Liddy until we got Baldwin, and that's like the second week of, of July. Um, but we were developing information about, or we had known about the money by then, and we knew the money had, had gone, uh, the, the checks had come from, uh, from the committee to reelect because Dahlberg told us that you know, had given the check to the committee to reelect. Um, Magruder's name came up, I think, via Sloan initially, and 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 his involvement with uh, 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 with Liddy. I think uh, you may have learned about Liddy a little bit earlier because he gets fired. He's fired by Creep. Right. That's when we find his telephone number. His telephone number. Uh, was barely readable in one of those uh, address books. Remember I was telling you about yes. the initials yes. GL? Yeah. And when we went to interview him, he, like I said, he immediately invoked attorney-client privilege and allegedly is fired the same day. Um, but as we later find out through Baldwin, um, Liddy had been involved from early May or mid-May, somewhere around there. Uh, Baldwin is who gives you the background on Liddy. He gives us the background on Liddy and, uh, and, and Hunt. Um, does he also give you a sense of what they were looking for when they went in the first time at DNC and why they went in a second time? The second time was to, to correct a defect um, and, and apparently move the device from one telephone to another. Uh, what they were looking for was uh, basically intelligence information on the Democratic uh, game plan. Um, but that wasn't the information they were getting. So they went back into, uh, their, their goal was to go back in, uh, replace the, the, uh, the one, uh, they had a microphone that apparently had been placed uh, on a beam. Apparently it was a steel beam and it wasn't transmitting. So. Uh, that was the device that the police department thought was the the makings of a of a precursor for a uh, for a bomb, uh, but it was was just a standard uh, microphone. The second one was the uh, the telephone device uh, was to be moved from the front office actually into uh, O'Brien's office. Um, now that the FBI would find a, a a listening device 
few weeks into the investigation of the DNC. Wasn't there a second device that you found there? That, that's the conflict. Uh, <laughs> the the um, the re, uh, that was another request that had been held up for for unknown reasons. Um, the day that of the break in later that afternoon, uh, telephone security uh, individual uh, along with two age, two technical agents uh, had gone to um, the Democratic headquarters. Uh, I thought that a 100% sweep had been done. Uh, how they do these things, I really don't know, but they did tell me that they tore telephones apart and uh, they, they didn't find anything. Um, I think it was six weeks into the investigation, maybe two months into the investigation. It was sometime after the Democrats had filed a lawsuit against the Republicans that uh, uh, the Democrats found a... Uh, or, Somebody in the in the campaign there had found a uh, device on a telephone, and I I'm not sure if it was Spencer Oliver's phone or uh, so the, I, I just don't recall. So that's when. So actually, the the only device found the the the, the, the day of the arrest was the device in the beam. Right. The only device found was the one that was the transmitter in the beam. And the ones that were wrapped up in the tissue paper. And the ones that were wrapped, but I'm the only one that was the planted in the, in the actual office of the DNC. Well, we so don't know. We, we presume that's what what was wrong. Um, see, he was McCord was trying to conceal it or had concealed the device into a um, smoke alarm, smoke detector, which they had removed from the Howard Johnsons, and they were uh, putting this thing in in this device into the smoke detector. And was it on the wall? I don't know. We never did learn whether it was there, but we figured that they were having problems because Baldwin said they were having problems monitoring these two devices. One, they couldn't get anything from. And there was some indication that McCord said, well, we probably put it you know, on a beam or too close to a beam, and we're going to have to move it. So maybe that was the live one that they found you know, that, that day, the police department found that day. But the police department did not find the, that day, the tap on the phone of Spencer Oliver. No, no, no. So that really only comes later as a result of what Baldwin's telling you. Right. Because then he's telling you, well, we actually had two, and, and so you guys go back in, or, or does the police do that? I'm not sure who, who would do that, who went and swept and found. Well, we did a sweep. Uh, we did a, a precursor the, the day of and then we asked permission to go into the headquarters uh, in fact I think the Democrats asked for the sweep and uh, for, for some reason or other it was delayed um, but then when they finally did it telephone security guy and and some agents um, supposedly checked all the phones and didn't find anything um, a week or so later the Democrats find this device um, Earl was thoroughly mad at me because, you know, he says we overlooked it. I, I said the Democrats planted it, but uh, I think Earl was right. We overlooked it somehow. Um, uh, in September, when John Dean, this is the, the, the day of the indictment, September 15th, John Dean meets with the president and says to the president, it's unbelievable. The FBI has launched the largest investigation since the JFK assassination. Unbelievable. Um, how was it a decision from above that, the, that this should grow? Was it just because you had so many leads? How was it? Did, it keep, did your task force keep growing um, after, uh, you, you mentioned the first week after the break-in it grew. Um, did, it, did it continue to grow beyond the 25? Or was no, it no, it's, it stayed because they were all, all the agents involved were thoroughly familiar from that first week on. You know, they stayed around until until the indictment. Until September. Until September. Then it whittled down to perhaps 10 or 12 from there. Um, and it stayed about 6 or 8 until the following year. And then it grew back up again. <laughs> tell, tell us how, how this works. Once there's an indictment, you're working 
you work for the FBI, but you're also working for the prosecutor. And Correct. So you keep, I mean, once there's an indictment, there's just... doesn't necessarily stop because uh, you're going back and, and you're reviewing the evidence. You may have overlooked something, so, fill, you know, fill in the gap there. Uh, you go back and re-interview the witnesses uh, or potential witnesses. Um, tell us, I know it's been a long time, but when you get to the indictment, um, did you have a sense that that wasn't the whole story? Those first, that first set of indictments, the seven. Mm, no, well, there there was some. We had a we had a problem with Magruder. Um, Magruder gave three different statements. Now, Porter, uh, he gave one statement, and he kind of stuck to that one statement. Um, my problem was that, uh, and it was always there, that uh, something was wrong. Why would Dean lie to us? And we could never figure out why. Um, he, he never indicated anything. And, and the other problem was, why were we always being delayed? Why couldn't we do things when, like you're supposed to? You have a bank rob, uh, you go in, you interview the witnesses, you chase down the suspects, you go to court, you know, and that's your case. Uh, this, it just seems like you ran into, you develop a lead, uh, that lead would lead you somewhere else, but you ran into a stone wall when you got to the second half of the lead. Uh, why the roadblocks? We just, you know, just couldn't figure out why. Why we kept running into all the various impediments along the way, uh, but then you know we we'd overcome the hurdle and and move on. But there was always that lingering thought, you know, why would Dean tell us he didn't know there was an office when he had been in there three days before? Um, why would Magruder say I only gave him uh, eighty thousand when he gave him? 150,000 or 250,000, whatever it was. Um, why didn't Magruder tell us that he had seen memorandums um, and had passed them on to someone else? Uh, and then when you got to Strawn, Strawn says, well, I don't remember any memorandums, and even if I did, uh, I would have given them back to Magruder. Well, as we find out, they went you know, further up the, the chain of command. So yeah, questions were raised, but you just couldn't get the people to answer. We were talking about memor memoranda regarding Gemstone. The gemstone, gemstone, yes. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, when, the, when the investigation widens again in 73. What causes it to widen again in 73? Um, I think the initial start uh, was the president had nominated... Pat Gray to become the director. And within a week, I think, Gray called a conference. Um, the assistant directors, myself, McDermott, and uh, Gray's uh, aides, and he had a memorandum in his hand which he passed around. And he said that, uh, he immediately said that Shortly after the investigation began, uh, John Dean had approached him and he had given John Dean the results of all the interviews that had been conducted in that, that first week and subsequently gave him the reports from July 5th on. And I was just astounded. I, and I just, I didn't jump out of my chair, but I said, now I know why. Now I know why we couldn't do, um, why we weren't getting the results of the interviews that we wanted. And he, you know, he questioned me and he says, what are you talking about? I says, well, here, as a matter of fact, you're giving him information that we developed on Monday. He has it in his hands on Tuesday. And he can see that on Wednesday we want to interview so-and-so uh, at the White House or at Creep. He's already had 24 hours to grab these people and prepare them, which, as it turns out, in fact, did happen. Uh, a prime example was that, again, going through that telephone book, 
there was a telephone, it said, a notation in the telephone book, HH and a telephone number. Reflecting back, you know, on, on, on this meeting, um, that telephone number came back, well, I had to call the phone company with a subpoena, uh, and they identified the, the uh, phone as being a White House phone. And when we traced the phone to, uh, via GSA, it turned out that it was in the, quote, office of the plumbers. But our contact at the phone company said, the strange part about it is the phone's here, but the bill's being sent to Alexandria, Virginia. And I asked Carl, I said, are you sure? And the guy at the phone company, and Carl says, yeah, he says, it's Kathleen Chanel. So I called George Sullivan, our liaison at the White House, and I said, is there a Kathleen Chanel on the, you know, on the uh, uh, um, telephone directory? And he says, yeah, he works, she works for uh, 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 Bud Crow. And um, I said, well, you know, is she around? He says, I'll check. And he said, I think she's on vacation. I said, oh, okay, fine. So he sent a couple of agents over to Alexandria. And one of her girlfriend's or roommates happened to be home, and she said she's in uh, Birmingham, England on vacation. So they came back, and they said, don't worry about it. We'll do it. Type up, send a teletype immediately to headquarters saying, uh, have league at London locate, and we had the address, telephone number. And the next day, um, McDermott called and said, your, your uh, league at request for uh, Chanel is on hold. And I said, why? He said, I don't know, just got a call from, uh, who was it? I think it was Charlie Bates who was, or Bob Gebhardt, whoever the assistant director was at the time told Kunkel that call from, from Gray's office to the assistant director over to McDermott put the, the call on, uh, the interview on hold. Uh, the White House was going to fly her back. Well, what's the White House have to do with, you know, it's our interview, not the White House interview. So, again, you know, here you go. 24 hours later when, when uh, uh, we take her to the grand jury, you know, of course she's already briefed. Uh, she's told by Dean certain things that she's not supposed to reveal, uh, and, and we lose a we lost a big element there uh, because you know Chanel knew. Oh, excuse me. Something fell. Oh, wonderful. That. So when we're ready. Okay, that was a big element because Chanel. She was aware of of the activities of the quote plumbers. Uh, in, in their little office down there in the, uh, I guess, I don't know, it wasn't quite the basement, but it was on the lower level of the executive office building where uh, Hunt and Liddy and, uh, you know, hung out. So, um, you know, sh I'm sure that at the time she could have told us what, what their involvement was, but um, in, in what aspects uh, uh, of the investigation they were involved in. Um, but. What did we, you? What, what are we talking about? Is that the summer of '72? Are we talking about July or no, August? No, uh, that was. Um, when when are you investigating the the HH from the Anderson? During the summer of '72. So during the summer of '72, you could have learned about the plumbers. We oh we well I knew about the plumbers because the first time I went to the executive office building, um, George Sullivan, the uh, uh, liaison was showing me around the executive office building and we were walking down the hallway and, and there's a little sign on the door that says plumbers and I said you got to be kidding me and he says no that's plumbers office and uh, I said oh I know who they are I said they're the guys that investigate leaks because there were a lot of leaks you know going on uh, prior to the yes. prior to the break-in uh, so but it was just a you know a passing joke I never had I had never put two and two together at that time. You didn't know that one of those plumbers was <laughs> E. Howard Hunt, <laughs> e. Howard or the other Hunt one was G or, or Gordon Liddy, or Gordon Liddy, or Bud Crow, or you know whatever. So, so it's, uh, but but so I mean that was a reflection back from events that happened on February twenty third when when Gray tells us that he had been given all this information to the White House or given it to Dean. You know, it suddenly occurs to me. 
oh, then that's why we didn't get Kathleen Chanel. Uh, that's why, uh, what's his name, Chapin and uh, Gordon Strawn's face got red when we were asking uh, questions about, you know, Donald Segretti, uh, because they weren't fully prepared for, the, for that interview. Uh, he didn't have enough time to, Dean didn't have enough time to uh, uh, fully brief um, uh, Chapin and, and uh, Strawn on the Segretti issue uh, when we walked in, you know, for the interview. Um, How do you think that happened? Was it just because you, you moved quickly from we, a... We moved, we, we were moving, sometimes we were moving fast and sometimes we were delayed. Uh, but it was like, uh, I think I think I had made contact with Chapin uh, before before Dean knew we were coming, and Chapin had agreed to the interview, and it was only like maybe five or six hours, five or six hour interview inter, uh, interval when when the interview took place. So um, they just weren't up for it. So it's we're we're in February seventy three, and we were talking about how. The investigation starts to expand again. Okay, well, as I said, um, so so Gray tells us about all these reports, and so uh, at the end of that conference, I was just flabbergasted. Uh, in fact, I was uh, uh, I re I reminded uh, Silbert, and I said, you know, February, right? And he says, Yeah, that's about when we things started rolling all over again. And I said, and and I I came to your office, and I said, and I was really upset. And he says, well, that's when we sat down and had to, had to initially go back over everything, um, see what we missed, and, and who can we go and, and re-subpoena, bring them back to the, because the grand jury had never left, um, put them back in the grand jury and see if we can, and, uh, see if we can develop uh, any further information. It was either, it was sometime probably two weeks after that, um, we had our first indication that uh, there was a crack in the dam, and, and I think that was Magruder. Um, Earl brought him back in, or Sloan. One, I'm not sure. It must have been Sloan, because this, Sloan is before, this is before the McCord letter. It's, it's like a week before the McCord letter. Yeah. So it must have been Sloan, because Magruder doesn't crack until after the McCord letter. I don't well, think. Not, not necessarily crack, but, but he, no, he was already coming around with another story. Uh, so, you know, you got to put all these stories together and see which one's going to be the, you know, the one so, we're going to so, go so with. So he might have come actually before the McCord letter. Right. Um, so, so you have the, the February conference with, or with, 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 with Gray. The, Gray, the Gray memo. That leads to a discussion with Silbert, and you guys decide, we got to look into this. Look, we have to look, look back, into, probably start. Dean, look into Dean and all of this. Yeah, because I, I said, you know, the lingering thing here is you, that box sitting right over there on the floor. I said, how that all started, and because I had turned that evidence over to them, they used, I don't think they used any of it for the trial, but turned everything over for the, for the trial in, in January. Uh, so all the evidence was sitting either in court or, or in Earl's office, and the box was still in plain view, and I said, you know, there's a haunting aspect of the whole case right there. Just to, just to point on, on the box, of course, you didn't know that part of... The, 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 yes, well, you might want because to Earl... Um, it was just before the trial, and there's this discovery period where uh, the government turns over all their evidence to, uh, to the different defendants. And uh, Earl called me this one day, and he says, uh, bring me those notebooks. And I said, what notebooks? And he says, they're two Hermes notebooks. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And, you know, we, we had this bantering back and forth. Um, and I said, you know, Earl, everything we got, you got. No, 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 you're withholding. I said, I'm not withholding anything. So uh, he says, well, Hunt claims that there are these two books, and they're pretty damaging. And I said, Earl, there wasn't anything in there except that Kennedy thing and the, the pistol uh, and some makeup stuff, the wig and false teeth and whatnot. And he says, all right. Uh, so he called. Of course, by then we knew that Dean had gotten the box before, and Dean said he didn't know anything about the, these two notebooks. So Earl, Earl called me back again, and he says, "I want you to go to every 
department store, stationery store, you can find, find a Hermes notebook so I can show it to Hunt and see if this is what he's, I couldn't find it. I went everywhere all over Washington looking for someone to sell me a Hermes notebook. I couldn't find them. And Hunt didn't remember where he bought them from. So it, it, the issue died there. I mean, he, he had a legitimate protest. We weren't turning over all the evidence that was uh, recovered from his office. And I didn't know that there were any notebooks missing. And we never had them, so. No, well, you might tell the... <laughs> well, we know later that uh, um, when Dean began to cooperate, in fact, I think he was interviewed or contacted by Henry Peterson, and he even told the assistant attorney general that he didn't know anything about the notebooks. Um, but then eventually when he begins to cooperate with the government, either he or his lawyer says that he had the notebooks and he destroyed them. So. And well, what was turned over to, to, Earl, to Patrick Bray? Um, before Hunt released the box to us, he and Ehrlichman had gotten a hold of... You mean uh, Dean? Uh, Dean and Ehrlichman had gotten a hold of uh, Pat Gray, and they passed him an envelope. Um, and according to Gray, he didn't read them, uh, but he thought it had something to do with Vietnam, uh, some type of memorandum, State Department cablegrams, similar to, I guess, what we had found, what was in the box that Dean had turned over to us. But uh, Gray says that he took them home and destroyed them. Well, first he said he took them home and destroyed them. But another time he said that he put them in the burn basket at FBI headquarters. So claims he never read them. So I don't know what happened to him. We never saw him. Um, how big was the, did the uh, task force grow to be uh, in, the, in 73? Um, I don't think it was more than a 10 or 15 agents at the time, maybe 15 at the most. And so now most, of, most of the investigation in 73 was uh, primarily uh, follow-up interviews or um, any new information developed from the people that were beginning to cooperate. Um, Dean mentioned the, uh, the illegal wiretaps. So we undertook that project, uh, you know, at at, uh, at the office because it was kind of an in-house uh, investigation to begin with. Um, and the big thing there was that uh, it turns out that they weren't illegal uh, because we eventually found the uh, the authorization from the attorney general. So there's nothing illegal about it. Um, but uh, uh, that must have been interesting for you since it was a bureau story we 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 got into it uh, we we did interview the people that were responsible for the installation we interviewed a couple of agents that were monitors and then it was we were into it and then it was about the time that um, I think the special prosecutor's office was being formed so we were kind of being pulled back but the investigation was picked up by the inspection division of, of FBI headquarters, and they completed it. Um, and the interesting part of the uh, the story in the beginning, of course, is where where was the where was the tape, where were the transcripts, uh, and then it turned out, of course, that 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 Sullivan had given them to Ehrlichman. Ehrlichman or Mardian? Mardian, but then they ended up in Ehrlichman. ended up in Ehrlichman's office, so. right? Who said he didn't know where they were or didn't didn't have them, right? <laughs> Um, but you, you oversaw that investigation? Uh, the, well, initially, 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 until we were uh, pulled off and, and it was taken over by the, uh, by the inspection division. So when Dean, told, when Dean told the prosecutors about them, he said that they were wiretaps that the FBI had done without... A, a well, they called them the 17 or 19 yes. illegal wiretaps. Yes. And I think it was, it was quoted that way for quite a long time, but it was probably... Within two months of, of uh, now, this would have taken place at headquarters, uh, of, of going through uh, uh, the what they call electronic surveillance records at FBI headquarters, that they eventually found a memorandum from Hoover to Mitchell, 
and then Mitchell's signature uh, author, given the authorization to do it. So they no longer became illegal. Well, at least they were authorized. Yeah, they were authorized, right. And I think there is some debate over right. the constitutionality of it. Um, uh, now, tell us, you're now looking at the White House, it, its role in the cover-up. And at some point, you're beginning to study the cover-up. It's no longer just the crime, right? And, um, I mean, are you, are you beginning to look at what steps were taken to make your job harder to do your investigation? Well, when, when Gray resigned, he, he was up on the Hill, his confirmation hearings, little things were, were coming out. Um, but when he resigns and we find the memorandums about the, the information that the CIA had given to Hunt and Liddy, um, we knew immediately where the hold had come from. We never saw any memorandums from um, General Walters. Apparently they were all personal contacts and, you know, carrying messages back and forth, but we never saw any written material. Um, when you start uh, interviewing uh, Strawn at this point, um, how helpful is he? Again, he was similar to Magruder. Um, the memorandums that Magruder saw, Magruder says, I passed them to Strawn. Uh, Strawn one day would say, I think I saw it or I didn't see it. And I didn't pass it on to anyone. Um, had no reason to pass it on to anyone, but later we find out that they had even been to, to uh, Bob Haldeman's office. Uh, and I think that came from Larry Higby. I believe it was Higby that had given that information. That he recalled these memos? That he, that he recalled the, the chain of command as to where the memos were going and who, who, let, who had uh, possession of them uh, who took possession of them in the end, and they, they would always go back to uh, Strawn, uh, at which time Strawn says, well, if I had them, I burned them, or I destroyed them. These are memorandums, again, for... Again, yeah, these are memorandums dealing strictly with, uh, with gemstone and or disbursements of money, one or the other. Was there also a uh, line of questioning about the intelligence that came from gemstone, and who saw that as well? Um... There was, but I, I, I don't recall the, the sequence of events on that one. Um, uh, do you get involved in investigating the plumbers in 73? Crow and Young? Yes. Um, tangentially, uh, most of that, we delivered the subpoenas, immediately ran them to the grand jury. We were dealing with a, a few hard things there. Toward the end, or in that 73 time period, it just seemed like information was just flowing into the press. You, you couldn't do anything. You, you'd do an interview. Um, what's the lady's name? Uh, Judy Hoback at the Committee to Re-elect. We were conducting interviews at, uh, at the Committee to Re-elect at one point, uh, just to give you an example. And uh, we weren't getting any cooperation because just like at the White House, Dean was present in all the interviews. The committee to reelect, they had two, two lawyers over there sitting in on in, all the interviews, uh, Ken Parkinson and Paul O'Brien. Um, so the, the people weren't being, they weren't coming forward. They weren't coming out of the woodwork to, to help the investigation, be it in 72 or 73. Um, but this one secretary uh, decided to uh, reveal all and she asked for a, a confidential interview which we did and within I think it was within 24 or 36 hours the interview was in the Washington Post the whole 302 we never again were able to get cooperation from the the committee to reelect um, who did it you know who knows um. How, how is your thinking about 
uh, the case evolving by this point. I mean, this is a very different case from what you what you what started, we started out with. with. Right. What um, you know? What what are you seeing? What 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 are the avenues that that you guys are starting to explore? Well, as as soon as Gray revealed the fact that he had given every document that went to FBI headquarters to Dean, um, it became obvious that every one of these people was prepped in one way or another. And that's when we just, Earl and Seymour said, well, we just have to go back over the whole case again. So we just started nitpicking here and there. Uh, I think I said Magruder. Might have been, uh, was Magruder and Bart Porter, I think, were the first two to come in and, and kind of change their story a little bit. Um, but when when Dean uh, when Dean um, began to cooperate, I mean, it, it just you know all the avenues opened up. Can we just can, we, can you uh, sorry, uh, Angie? Can you repeat that about Dean when when Dean began to cooperate, the the in, the, the new investigation just opened wide up. Uh, the um, the individuals that we had. Suspected like Ehrlichman and and uh, and Young, um, just jump right out of us. Tell us when you started to ask people whether the president kept a record. It was an interview, uh, and I, I believe it was um, an individual named Bruce Curley, and he may have been interviewed about the time that we were looking for. Um, we we were doing the. Uh, um, investigation into how Dean got into the safe and I, it may have been in that time period um, we had asked um, Curly whether uh, the president ever made any record um, written or otherwise and he said that uh, he had indicated that the president used a dictabelt a recording machine at night to record his memoirs whatever um, and I believe that was the first subpoena uh, for anything dealing with uh, electronic devices, electronic recordings issued by uh, uh, Earl Silbert and the uh, federal grand jury to the White House. We, that was delivered to, uh, to John Dean uh, because he was the legal counsel. He accepted all subpoenas. Uh, we never got a response to that. We never saw a dicta belt. We never saw a dictating machine. Um, but then about a year later, uh, when Alex Butterfield uh, reveals the taping device, we felt like, well, we knew it existed months ago, not that particular device, but we knew there was a recording uh, made some time back, but w it was never revealed, never revealed to us. Did uh, Dean hint that he thought he might be, do you recall Dean hinting that he thought he might be taped or might have been taped? Uh, to me personally, no. To the prosecutors, he, he had indicated that, yes. Okay. Uh, and how did, the, uh, how did the investigation change once you knew that you had tapes? That we had tapes? Uh, yes. I mean, there were tapes that existed. You didn't have them yet. Um, when the special prosecutor's office came in and I was kind of, taken away from Earl and Seymour and Don, I moved to the Special Prosecutor's Office. Uh, they, the Special Prosecutor's Office um, conducted most of the investigation themselves. They would give us ancillary leads to, to, to handle. Um, if they wanted um, John Dean or Pat Gray or Ehrlichman uh, interviewed, they did it themselves. Um, we, we just picked up the aftermath. We really, we were engaged with them, but it wasn't uh, like it was previously with the sitting prosecutor. So you were more of the, the you were the investigative force for the prosecutor's office. Yes. And the White House, the WSPF had its own force, had its own investigative Well, they group. did their own, yeah. Uh, they had their staff. They didn't have, per se, they didn't have investigators, but they act, the prosecutors acted like investigators. What was your group formally?